Uh, we're in the final series, uh, final Sunday of our summer series, in Jesus' seven messages to the seven churches in Asia Minor in Revelation. And Jesus has held himself out to us as the Lord of glory, the Lion of Judah. He has roared in power as the one who has authority over his church and is beckoning her to respond to him with love and obedience. And we have this summer been confronted with realities like idolatry and apathy and sexual sin. We've sat under the conviction of the Holy Spirit and we've allowed him to place his finger on some sore spots. But this morning, my prayer and my heart's desire is that we would be surprised by grace. That even having sat under the deep conviction of what God has called us to as a people, that's good and right, that we would leave here surprised by the grace of God. Surprised by grace. The church in Laodicea, this last church, are saved till last because they are by far the worst church. They have kicked Jesus out of their midst. They are barely even Christians. In many ways, they seem to be kind of emblematic of everything we've seen so far. They are a mess. And I am eager this morning that we would hear the roar of the Lion of Judah as he brings his final word to these churches. These Laodicean Christians have sat listening, like us, for the last six weeks. They've listened to the last six messages that Jesus has had for these churches. And their anxiety has been growing. What is he going to say to us? How will Jesus conclude? What is the final note that he wants to strike in his message to these struggling and sinful churches? Have a look at Revelation 3, and we'll find out how he ends his message to the church. From verse 14. Write to the angel of the church in Laodicea. Thus says the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the originator of God's creation. I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish that you were cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I am going to vomit you out of my mouth. For you say, I'm rich. I have become wealthy and need nothing. And you don't realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. I advise you to buy from me gold refined in the fire so that you may be rich, white clothes so that you may be dressed and your shameful nakedness not be exposed, and ointment to spread on your eyes so that you may see. As many as I love, I rebuke and discipline. So be zealous and repent. See, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and eat with him and he with me. To the one who conquers, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne, just as I also conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. Let anyone who has ears to hear listen to what the Spirit says to the churches. This is the word of the Lord. The structure of this sermon gloriously subverts the structure of all six sermons before. And we'll get there, but it begins the way that every other sermon has. Remember, all summer we've been doing Christ, church, consequence. And like every other, Jesus begins with himself. He holds his glory out to them. Who is Jesus? Who is this one that approaches them to speak? One line, he is the amen, the faithful and true witness, the originator of God's creation. Your translation may differ, we'll come back to that. But in one word, what Jesus wants his church to see is this. He is the beginning and the end of all of God's works and purposes. He is, in two Greek words, the arche and the amen. Jesus is the arche. The CSB that I just read calls him the originator. The NIV calls him the ruler. And the reason for that is that this one Greek word arche just means first or beginning, and it, it really can imply both. First in order, the greatest, or first in time, the earliest. Sorry, first in authority. So think archangel, the highest angel or archetype, the earliest thing. And Jesus wants us to know he is both the greatest and the oldest of all things. The greatest and the oldest. That's why St. Augustine called him beauty 
so ancient and so new. Everything that we have and know, everything that we are, has come from his hand. The Apostle Paul called Jesus the firstborn of all creation. Elsewhere, he writes that all things, he means all, all things are for him and through him and from him. He is the word of God, the creator of heaven and earth. Everything visible and invisible comes from his power. Mountains and angels and breath and joy comes from the overflow of the goodness of Jesus. Psalm 33, 6 says, By the word of the Lord, the heavens are made. That's Jesus. He is the arche, the first, the beginning. And because he is first, he is also the greatest. He made the wind, and so the wind obeys his voice. He made the angels, and so they serve him and worship him. He made you and I, and so we owe all allegiance and worship and authority back to him. He is the Arche and he is the Amen. He doesn't just initiate everything, but he brings everything to completion. He brings all of God's work to fulfillment. 2 Corinthians 1 says, all the promises of God have found their Amen in him. In him. Every promise God has made to his people. Jesus is the one that delivers the goods. He is faithful and true. He delivers on every promise. He never lets his people down. He never gives up on what he has said he will do. In other words, we need to know this morning that there is no blessing, no goodness, no joy, no happiness in this world that can be found outside of the person of Jesus Christ. Jesus alone mediates the life and love of God to us. Whenever and wherever God has revealed himself to humanity, he does it through his son. That's why John says that Isaiah, quote, saw the glory of Jesus. Because there's no way to encounter the father except through his son. That has always been the case. It always will be. At Christmas, we sing the song, O come, O come, Emmanuel. One of the verses goes like this. O come, O come, thou Lord of might who to thy tribes on Sinai's height in ancient times did give the law in cloud and majesty and awe. Rejoice, rejoice, Emmanuel shall come to thee, O Israel. Jesus gave the law to Moses on Mount Sinai. Or in the words of Jude, quote, Jesus delivered his people out of Egypt. It's always been Jesus. He's the beginning and the end. There is no one apart from him. Every saving work of God, every revelation of the Father, it's Jesus. Thomas Torrance puts it this way. He says, there is in fact no God behind the back of Jesus. No act of God other than the act of Jesus. No God but the God we see and meet in him. Jesus Christ is the open heart of God. The very love and life of God, the mighty hand and power of God stretched out to heal and save sinners. When the Bible says there is one mediator between God and man, it means one. It has always been Jesus. It will always be Jesus. If you don't know him, you don't know God. Because he is the RK and the Amen. Everything good comes to us through him. And now that is exactly what this church needs to hear. They must hear this because, as we'll see, they have presumed upon the gifts of God. They are arrogant and complacent and vain. Let's read again, verse 15 to 18. Jesus says to the church, quote, I know your works. You are neither cold nor hot. I wish that you were cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I'm going to vomit you out of my mouth. For you say, I'm rich, I have become wealthy and need nothing. And you don't realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind and naked. So I advise you to buy from me gold refined in the fire so that you may be rich, white clothes so that you may be dressed and your shameful nakedness not be exposed and ointment to spread on your eyes so that you may see. Throughout the summer, we have seen six other churches. Ephesus were loveless, but 
they were orthodox. Pergamum and Thyatira were slipping into sexual sin, but they were holding on in the midst of persecution. Even Sardis, spiritually dead, had some people that were still walking in holiness. But the church in Laodicea, according to Jesus, has nothing worth commending. One commentator says that his denunciation of them is, quote, without any parallel. It doesn't get worse than this. The Laodicean church, Jesus says, are vomit-inducing because of their vanity. And he says he wants to vomit them out because they are lukewarm. We've taken this phrase and we've kind of made it something it's not. We use the word lukewarm like, ah, I'm a bit of a lukewarm Christian to mean half-hearted or just a bit disinterested. It's just not what Jesus is talking about at all. We need to be clear on that because if you're just a bit disinterested this morning, Jesus doesn't intend to vomit you out of his mouth. He is not saying that he would prefer it if someone hated him than if they were a little bit off and on. A half-hearted faith is a tragedy, but it is still a faith. That is not Jesus' issue. They are not simply half-hearted. He calls them lukewarm to use a metaphor. There's a kind of running theme in ancient writings of the disgustingness of lukewarm water. One of Aesop's, Aesop's fables is bizarre. Three men take turns drinking lukewarm water, and the moment they drink it, they all just vomit it up because it's so gross. Imagine you went to wash your dishes and the tap wouldn't run hot. It was just tepid. You couldn't get the grease out. Or you came into the house from a sweltering Glasgow day needing a drink of water and someone passed you a little lukewarm glass. That wouldn't be very refreshing at all. Lukewarm water isn't hot enough to clean and it's not cold enough to be refreshing. It's just useless. And that's the kind of water that Laodicea as a city had. It was so far from its water source that by the time the water reached them, it was lukewarm, useless. They couldn't wash in it. It wasn't very nice to drink. And Jesus is saying, I'm grieving over you because your faith matches your water supply. It's useless. I can't do anything with it. Jesus comes to the church, takes a gulp and vomits them back up. Why? These aren't two separate issues, he explains. The reason is because they are vain. He vomits them up because they are vain. If their faith has matched their water supply and its uselessness, that's really because they have matched the culture of their city in their hearts. Laodicea was wealthy and presumptuous. It's actually famous in their time that after an earthquake shook their city, Rome came offering financial help to rebuild the city and they said, no, we don't need it. We're good enough, we'll do it ourselves. They were presumptuous and arrogant. They valued their own self-sufficiency so highly. And the Christians are the same. Why is Jesus so disgusted at them? Because they strut around saying, I'm rich, I'm wealthy. I don't need anything. We need to see in Laodicea a profound threat to our souls. Paul chastises the Corinthians when he asks them this question, what do you have that you did not receive? What do you have that you did not receive? This church have forgotten where everything good comes from. Look at me. Look at me. I'm a self-made man. I don't need anything from anyone. That's what they stand before their city and say. But the one who is the RK and the Amen has given them every good thing. And now they flaunt it in his face. We're wealthy. We don't need anything from you. That is an issue that God's people have always wrestled with. On the banks of the Jordan, as God's people prepared to enter the land that God was going to give them, God warned them about becoming arrogant. Here's what he said in Deuteronomy 7, 17, quote, You may say to yourself, my power and my own ability have gained this wealth for me. But remember that the Lord your God gives you the power to gain wealth in order to confirm his covenant. And then just before that, he says, when you enter the land, do not forget the Lord your God. Do not forget who gave you the land. 
It's what the Laodiceans have done. They have forgotten who gave them everything that they have. It's God's warning to those who receive from him. Don't forget who gave you all this. Don't forget that Jesus alone is the giver of every good thing. Don't forget who saved you. This church are like the Pharisee who come before the temple and say, thank you, God, that I am not like that tax collector. Thank you that I am so wonderful, arrogant, and forgetful. That phrase is so dangerous. I need nothing. And it's so dangerous because it's so gloriously true. David says it in Psalm 23, doesn't he? The Lord is my shepherd. I need nothing. That's faith. But the Laodiceans say, we are our own shepherds, so we need nothing. One of those is godly, the other is demonic. Satan would like to take our godly gospel assurance, I need nothing because of Jesus, and morph it into sinful complacency. I need nothing because I am so wonderful. In a nutshell, assurance is rooted in the costly grace of Jesus. He paid it all for me, so I'm free. I don't need anything. But complacency is rooted in the cheap grace of false religion. God thinks I'm great, and so do I. Who wouldn't save me? That's complacency. Assurance says I'm an undeserving recipient of God's grace. I can't believe he forgives me. Complacency said, of course he forgives me. There's not that much to forgive. A complacent and arrogant posture will look at all the goodness of God in our lives. All the blessings of salvation. The gift of the church and his people and the spirit. And take credit for it ourselves. The sentiment, I need nothing. If you are not careful, will become stronger and stronger. You need Jesus. You have always needed Jesus. You will always need Jesus. All of your wealth and joy and success and happiness is a gift from him. It's not a replacement for him. Friends, true gospel life, true gospel life begins and ends with an understanding that we are desperately needy of Jesus. Desperately needy. Without him, you are not full, you're empty. You're not rich, you're poor. You're not dignified, you're naked. You're exposed for who you really are. That's why Jesus confronts them. You don't know that you're wretched and pitiful and poor and blind and naked. He wants them to see themselves from heaven's perspective. Without me, you're nothing. That's the invitation of repentance, to allow the great physician to diagnose and reveal the true sickness of our hearts. Gospel faith does not look like arrogant presumption. It looks like humble assurance. It sounds less like I need nothing and far more like what do I have that I haven't received? Our hearts, when we look at the blessings of God, should resound with the words of the song, when I survey the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died. When I look at all of that, my richest gain I count but loss. I poor contempt on all my pride. All that I am and have is nothing compared to the glory of Jesus in the gospel. He is everything, and all that I could bring him is nothing. Friends, do you, do you know that? Do you know that? If you're honest, when you survey, are you filled with gratitude or smugness? Are you filled with deep gospel joy or a sense that you are the architect of your life? The reality is that we will fail to turn to God if we don't know our need. Our prayer life will dry up. We won't pray with any sense of desperation because there's nothing we really need from him. We will lose the heart of our faith. The simple cry, Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me. A sinner, we don't grow out of that prayer. This side of heaven, you will pray that for the rest of your life. Have mercy on me. 
The church in Laodicea are all of those things, vomit-inducing because of their vanity, because of their vain complacency. And so Jesus comes to them and he urges them to go on a shopping trip. Come to me and buy the things you really need. You who think you're so wealthy, so rich. Come and buy gold, he says, because you're really poor. True riches are found in Jesus. Jesus wants them to know, he needs us to know in the 21st century that everything of this world will rot and rust and fade. Nothing that you have built for yourself, your bank account, your home, will not come with you into the kingdom of God. And this church can glow all they want, but they will not take their wealth through the grave with them. But Jesus has gone through death. And he has come out the other side alive and well and glorified. And all the riches that will last eternally are in him. So come to him, he says, and buy gold so that you might truly be rich. And then he says, come and buy white clothes. Because you are naked. Can you imagine Adam and Eve in that moment that they emerged from behind the tree covered in fig leaves thinking they were dignified? How pitiful and embarrassing. And Jesus says, you're not dignified. Without me, you're just covered in fig leaves. So come to me, he says. Buy white clothes, let me cover your shame. Jesus offers to clothe us in himself. We might hide ourselves in him so that when the Father sees us, he doesn't see our shameful nakedness. He sees the glory of the risen and exalted Christ. And he says, my beloved son, come. That's the offer. Be clothed in Christ, not in fig leaves. And then he says, come and buy ointment for your eyes because you're blind. Jesus offers us a way to see ourselves as we really are. To see him as he really is. The Laodiceans are blind to their own sinfulness, blind to the stunning glory of Jesus, and stumbling around, thinking they're all it. Jesus says, no, come. Buy ointment for your eyes. Open them. Here I am. Here's the rub. Jesus doesn't muddy the waters. It's not come and buy from somewhere. It's come and buy from me. Come and buy from me. There is no other place in the universe to find true riches. No other place to find a clothing for your shame. No other place to find your eyes open to reality. It's Christ or it's nothing. And we're trying to buy ointment from influencers saying, come open my eyes, let me see things as they really are. We're trying to buy clothing from our performance to cover our shame by the things we can do. Look, God, look what I've brought you. And we're trying to buy gold in the form of nice stuff. It is all passing away. It's all passing away. Jesus is the only one you can buy from. The knockoffs won't work. There is no timu for the kingdom of God. Come to Jesus, buy from him. Everything else is sinking sand. But Jesus says, come and buy from me. Before we move on, here's where we are. We need to get where we are because what's to come won't surprise us if we don't. Jesus is angry with this people. I mean, not sugarcoat that. He is angry. He is fuming before them with the wrath of a righteous God. They are vomit-inducing and vain. And now remember that every church Jesus has complained against up to this point, at this exact point in the letter, have been met with a negative consequence. So that to Ephesus, Jesus says, repent or I will remove your lampstand from its place. To Pergamum, he says, I will fight against you with the sword of my mouth. To Thyatira, he says, I will strike your children dead. And to Sardis, he says, I will come upon you like a thief in the night. Negative consequence. That is what is to come. Imagine the fear that this church are feeling in this moment. They've heard all that. 
they have heard Jesus list off a reel of churches that are doing better than they are and then threaten them with his judgment. They've heard the sorry state of their church directly from the mouth of Jesus. As someone stood in their church for that Sunday and read this letter from Jesus, imagine they started whispering, what is he going to do to us? What is the Lion of Judah going to do against this church? His words as we move on are paradigm shifting. Look at verse 19. As many as I love, I rebuke and discipline. So be zealous and repent. See, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and eat with him and he with me. To the one who conquers, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne. Just as I have also conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. What comes from the mouth of the wrathful Christ? I love you. I love you. To this vomit-inducing people, Jesus offers something more than a threat. He offers two invitations. Let me back in and eat with you. And come, reign with me. I want us to get something this morning. The animating center of the person of Jesus. And I know I'm treading on sticky ground here. That the animating center of the person of Jesus is not his wrath, it is his love. Isaiah 28, 21 describes judgment as his strange work. Lamentations 3, 33 says, quote, God does not afflict from his heart. In Hosea, Ephraim, that's the northern kingdom, boasts with words that sound almost quote, quoted word for word like this church. Here's his response in chapter 11. He says, how could I give you up? Oh, Ephraim, how could I give you up? The natural overflowing heart of God to his people is love. So Lamentation says he judges not from his heart, but Jeremiah 32, 41 says he does good to us with all his heart and soul. With all his heart and soul. That's sticky ground because God is not broken up into lots of pieces, but there is some truth in the Bible that would say that his deepest heart towards you is to bless and give and serve and save. I've said so many times this summer that my heart has been that we would see Jesus not just as the slain Lamb of God in John's Gospel, but as the risen Lion of Judah in Revelation. And as we finish, we need to see that reverse again. Because the Lion of Judah, who has thundered with all authority in heaven and earth, reveals himself again to be the meek and lowly and loving Lamb of God. Lowly and humble, merciful and kind. The Lion of Judah roars in wrath only to bring you to repentance. He roars to serve the purposes of his love. He cares for you. He cares for the church in Laodicea. You may know, I've said it to a few of you, I'm on a C.S. Lewis kick this year. I'm rereading everything he's ever written. And this last few weeks, I've been on his Space Trilogy, which is this kind of sci-fi series. And in his book, Perilandra, it is bizarre, but this passage reminded me of a scene in it. Perilandra is a reimagining of the temptation of Eve. This is going to sound weird. A middle-aged scholar travels to the planet Venus, encounters an unfallen human-like race, and then has to defend their purity when another scholar who's possessed by a demon shows up and tries to tempt them into sin. It's fine. (laughs) That's not the point. C.S. Lewis calls this demon-possessed man the un-man. He's like the devil in Genesis 3. And he's wooing the woman into sin. And the main character, Ransom, argues against him for days and days and days, but the devil doesn't need to sleep. And he does. And he finds himself losing the battle. And there is this stunning moment where he realizes that what he really needs to defeat the unman is hatred. 
Let me read to you what C.S. Lewis writes in this moment. He says, an experience that perhaps no good man can ever have in our world came over Ransom. A torrent of perfectly unmixed and lawful hatred came over him. The energy of hating never before felt without some guilt, without some dim knowledge that he was failing to distinguish the sinner from the sin, rose into his arms and legs till he felt they were pillars of burning blood. It is perhaps difficult to understand why this filled Ransom not with horror, but with a kind of joy. The joy came from finding at last what hatred was made for. So this man stands before the devil and finds himself filled with hatred because of his love towards this good thing. And he realizes what wrath and hatred are for. Jesus comes to his church, not only filled with love, but filled to the brim with hatred. And the hatred of Jesus is not like ours. We find ourselves hating sinners because of their sin. Jesus can distinguish. He despises and detests your sin. It is disgusting to him. He intends to vomit it out of his mouth. He's repulsed by your sin only because he's so deeply in love with you. He hates sin for what it has done to you. It is an offense to him. His wrath is not because he randomly just wants to attack someone. His wrath only exists because of his love. He intends to defeat your sin entirely with all the force of heaven's hatred against it. That's why Jesus' wrath is stunningly good news. He's not going to allow the devil to wreak havoc over your soul forever. He is not going to allow you to stay in sin. He can't bear to see you in sin. He can't stand it. And so he comes to the church with smoke coming from his nostrils. But he comes and lowers his voice. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and eat with him and he with me. He could barge the door down. He has the power, but he knocks and he waits. In the past, this church have welcomed him in with tepid tap water. So he said, don't worry, I'll set the table. I'll lay a spread before you. And as Revelation draws to a close, we see what meal Jesus is offering to them. Revelation 19 says this, Then I heard what sounded like a great multitude, like the roar of rushing waters and loud peals of thunder, shouting, Hallelujah, for our Lord God Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory, for the wedding of the Lamb has come. And his bride has made herself ready. Fine linen, bright and clean, was given her to wear. Jesus invites himself in for a wedding feast, for a banquet of love. He knocks at the door, says, I love you, and invites his bride to come and eat with him. His love is Song of Songs-esque. Look at this, Song 5, 2. The bride sings, I was sleeping, but my heart was awake. A sound, my love was knocking open to me. And in 5.1, the narrator of the song <clears throat> invites the couple, eat friends, drink your fill, lovers. The invitation of Jesus to his church as he stands at the door and knocks is to enter into his love. It's to enter into his love. That's the intimate invitation of the Christian life, the crescendo, the great finale of these letters. is not conviction, it's not judgment, it is love. If we are not careful, we will have sat in condemnation rather than conviction. And we will have believed a lie that all Jesus wants from us is to feel so guilty about our weaknesses. You need to hear this. Even to the most broken and lost of these seven churches, 
Jesus stands and beckons them in with all the loving intimacy of the kingdom of God. Your apathy or your struggles with sexual sin or your idolatrous wandering does not change the heart of God. It doesn't change the posture of his love towards you. He stands at the door and knocks. He knocks the door of those who have lost their first love. Invites them to open the door, rekindle the fire of their hearts. He knocks the door to suffering Christians and offers them strength. To sinning Christians, he has knocked and offered purity. To apathetic Christians, he has knocked and offered his spirit. To anyone who will hear and open the door, he has offered life and freedom. Right now, wherever you are on that trajectory, he stands at the door and knocks. Open up and I will come in and eat with you. He invites us to eat with him and rule with him. To the one who will pursue heavenly treasure over earthly boasting, who will open the door and let the bridegroom in, Jesus will give all authority. But only because he himself has all authority, only because he has conquered. He is the crucified, conquering king, the lover of our souls. And he says, come, share in my victory. About 10 weeks ago, I read Peter Lightheart's words to begin our series, and I read them somewhere in the middle, and I want to read them again to end. This is the invitation of the seven letters to the churches. He says, Jesus is a heptamorous sabbatical man, the man of seven who walks among seven lampstands with seven spirits and seven stars. He is the last Adam. He is man come to Sabbath maturity. Here's the invitation we will all be made like him when we see him as he is. All remade to have white hair like snow, flaming eyes, altar feet, voices like thunder, hands that can handle stars, swords in our mouths, faces like the sun. Jesus, the last Adam, is our measure. And his messages are one of his means for molding us to his image. In our prayer all along that we would have eyes to see the risen Christ as he is. And as he speaks that we would have ears to hear what his heart for us is. That is his heart for you. He says, come, eat with me and reign with me. Because when you see me, you're going to become like me. That's the stunning vision of eternal glory that awaits you. You will see him as he is. You will be made like him. And then you will sit on his throne and share in his glory. That's the promise to those who overcome. We've seen him this summer in his ascended and reigning power. We've heard him as he's rebuked and warned and comforted his church. His invitation to you this morning is to overcome to stand firm, to trust him, to conquer because he himself has conquered over sin and death. The day is coming. John continues in Revelation 4. Here is what is offered you. John sees Jesus on the throne and then he sees, verse 4, around the throne were 24 thrones. And on those thrones sat 24 elders dressed in white clothes with golden crowns on their heads. Flashes of lightning and rumblings and peals of thunder came from the throne. Four living creatures covered with eyes in front and back were around the throne on each side. He goes on to say each of those creatures never stopped saying, Holy, 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 Lord God the Almighty who was who is, who is to come. And whenever the living creatures give glory, honor, and thanks to the one on the throne, the one who lives forever, the 24 elders fall down before the one seated on the throne and worship the one who lives forever and ever. They cast their crowns before the throne and say, our Lord and God, you are worthy 
to receive glory and honour and power because you have created all things and by your will they exist and were created. Lord Jesus, we can't wait for that day where we fall face down before your throne and cast our crowns before you. Where we cast all of our worldly riches and wealth and joys before you and say they are not worthy. You, Jesus, are worthy. <clears throat> you are worthy of power and honour and glory and strength. Jesus, we come to you as those who without you are pitiful, wretched, poor, naked and blind. Some of us come to you not knowing you, perhaps acknowledging for the first time that we are those things. Thank you, Jesus, that you offer us gold and white clothing, ointment for our eyes. Thank you, Jesus, that your grace is so unrelenting that even to us, you would come and invite us into eternal life. Lord, we open the door. If we hear you knocking this morning, we open the door, whether it is to wake up our sleepy hearts, whether it is to save us for the first time, whether it is just to let you in to have intimacy with us this morning. Holy Spirit, would you give us ears to hear the knock on the door of our hearts? Come, Holy Spirit. Make us a people that swing that door open. <laughs> Jesus, we pray you would come in. Come into our midst this morning by the Holy Spirit. Eat with us, we pray. We worship you, Jesus. You are the Lion of Judah and the Lamb who was slain. You are all in all the King of Kings. We thank you that we are yours.